Thank you, Dan, from British Divers Marine Life Rescue for being here today with us. Um, we're so excited to have you and to hear from you and the organization. So uh, first things first, for people who are not familiar with uh, British Divers, how would you describe your organization to them in a few sentences? So British Divers Marine Life Rescue is a charity of volunteers who we refer to as marine mammal medics and they have undergone training in health assessment, first aid and rescue techniques for marine mammals and essentially that enables us to act as a frontline rescue and response service for marine mammals that may be in distress around the coastline of the UK. So when when did you guys get started and what is what was kind of the purpose of starting this organization? The charity began back in 1988 by a group of divers. That's where the name comes from in our name, um, uh, where the word comes from in our name. And that uh, group of divers came together in response to an outbreak of a disease called Focine distemper virus. And that hadn't been seen before in Northwest Europe. Um, the outbreak started in the Baltic Sea and came across from through Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands and jumped across to the east coast of the UK. And it mostly affected common seals, one of our two native species. And there were many animals washing up around the coast, particularly in uh, places like Norfolk and Suffolk and Lincolnshire, where there's a high population of that species uh, that had been affected by this virus. And as nothing like this had really happened before, uh, you know, rescue uh, and rehabilitation organisations, mainly the RSPCA back then really, uh, were completely overwhelmed by the volume of casualties needing assistance. So this is where this group of divers came in. They started working with the RSPCA, assisting them on the beaches and transporting animals to uh, vets or rehabilitation facilities so that they could be taken care of. And it grew out from there to what we are today. Are the founding members, the group of divers, they're still active or? Yeah, they are. Yeah, uh, many of them are still our trustees. Um, our chairman, Alan Knight, who, who started the group, um, is still there as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's really great to sort of have people like that who have seen the charity all the way through from the start, still with it now, very actively involved in keeping things moving forward and leading, which is, you know, it's really great to have that kind of support. Yeah. So why did you personally, or what motivated you personally to to join the, the organization, the charity? Uh, Stephanie, myself, um, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I didn't grow up wanting to be a marine biologist or a vet or an animal carer or anything like that. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was growing up. But when I was young uh, in school, we, we used to come away as a family to places like Devon and Cornwall in the summer holidays, school summer holidays. Um, and we lived in pretty much the middle of the country in Birmingham, so we never otherwise had much contact with the coast. Um, and it was in these visits that we saw seals in the wild. We visited the Cornish Seal Sanctuary and saw some of the rescued seal pups. And we um, saw dolphins for the first time ever in the wild, which, you know, was just crazy. We didn't think we even got dolphins in the UK. And people still these days believe that still, you know, we've got a lot of education still to do. But, you know, it's just having those encounters, I think, just sort of sparked the interest. Um, and then it was when we actually moved down here as a family when I was just finishing school, was about to start college, um, that we saw an advertisement in the local newspaper for the BDMLR training course. Uh, so we went along and joined that. And we also got involved with Cornwall Wildlife Trust uh, and their Marine Strandings Network, which, which is similar to BDMLR. It's a network of volunteers this time trained to record and photograph dead marine uh, mammals that were washed up on the coast so we got involved with both and then things spiraled out from there again and, and I got involved with several more organizations uh, went on to do a degree in marine biology at the University of Plymouth um, worked at the Cornish Seal Sanctuary for 10 years and uh, eventually wound up where I am now working for BDMR so uh, it's all sort of come together 
quite conveniently for me over the years, I suppose, <laughs> in a way. But it's been, uh, you, you know, very. Uh, I feel very lucky to have had those opportunities and to have been involved for such a long time now. You know, just over twenty years since I've been involved in doing this sort of stuff now. So there's a lot of experience and things that we've learned along the way that we've been able to share uh, as we're a very busy area here in Cornwall where I'm based and uh, in a national role it enables me to share that more readily uh, with our teams around the rest of the country uh, but also with partner organizations in other countries too. Um, you you mentioned that uh, Cornwall tends to be very busy would you say it's a it's a hot spot for getting calls uh, related to to marine life in, in danger, so, yeah, right? Oh, most definitely, yes. So mm -hmm. Cornwall is usually the busiest region of the country in most years. Um, so in, in, in the last sort of four or five years, we've been seeing in excess of 450 calls per year, sometimes just topping over 500, in fact. Um, so well, yeah, that, that's, that's incredibly busy uh, for an area. Uh, nationally, uh, the number of calls that we receive on the hotline is uh, in 2021 was uh, just over 3,200. In 2022, it was uh, perhaps just slightly mm -hmm. less than 300. Um, but uh, if, you, if you go back just just a few years, uh, you know, back to 2017, we hadn't quite cracked a thousand call outs per year back then. So uh, that kind of gives you an idea of the trajectory of the number of calls that we're receiving. Not all of them, of course, result in rescue. Some of the animals are fine and people can be provided advice or we can go out and check and see the animal's okay if we're not sure. Then they can just carry on their way then. But uh, obviously the ones that do need help, and there are many reasons why that is, uh, we can provide them the help that they need when we can. So from those calls, um, you mentioned animals that may be washed up on, on the shore. What Typically, what are, what are the calls you get? What has been uh, an, a call that really was strange for some reason? Tell us a little bit about those calls. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, over 90% of the calls that we get to our hotline are regarding young seals within the first few days or weeks of their life. And they're usually the ones that do find themselves struggling for one reason or another, uh, whether that be due to human disturbance or storms separating them from their mums, uh, various kinds of injuries or infection. Uh, so that's mainly what we're dealing with on the beaches. Um, we also sometimes deal with stranded cetaceans, so porpoises, dolphins and whales that come up alive on the beaches too. And we can again have our volunteer teams respond in those situations to assess the animal with a vet, of course, always in those circumstances and make sure that whatever the outcome is, is right for the welfare of the animal. Uh, you know, that's that, that's essentially the main role that we play is, is as a uh, response organisation, the animals that we're going to would have to do what's in the best interest of their welfare. It's not just about throwing every dolphin, we see, uh, uh, every dolphin that we see back into the water as soon as we can. There's a lot more involved process uh, with that to make sure the animal's first of all suitable and if it is, doing it in the correct way. If not, then our role will be to relieve suffering. So that will involve euthanasia then. And we can learn a lot from those animals from a post-mortem examination. They can tell us a lot about the individual animal itself and its life story. Uh, we can learn more about uh, injuries and infections that they have, uh, learn why it's stranded in the first place uh, as well. So it's really important that we do that. And some of the things that we learn later get incorporated into our protocols as we learn new things um, and I think that's one of the really interesting things about this uh, kind of um, field that we work in is is that there is still a lot that we don't know we're still learning things some of them are new uh, such as the effect of climate change we're seeing more storms and that's resulting in more casualties and that's what you can see in our data it's one of the reasons why our falls are increasing so much in the last few years because these more extreme weather events are happening more frequently um, so thanks to our data, we're able to share that with our colleagues. We can put it forward for research, um, uh, you know, and re really uh, sort of get people to recognise and understand that, you know, this is yet another effect of uh, climate change that we're seeing. We're recording, we're seeing it in real time. Uh, and, and, and again, it, it provides convincing data uh, towards that end as well. Um, and it's also good 
uh, in, in use in education as well, getting people to understand why this is happening, why are we getting more calls? Well, it could be due to climate change. Sometimes it's due to public disturbance, people disturbing the animals by getting too close and so on. So there's a, uh, a lot that we can use, what we can learn, that we can then use to, to try and improve the situation for these animals as conservation measures then. So a big aspect of your organization is education from from all points of view, from from a more higher education level with the data, as you've mentioned, and then with people that might see this animal in the beach and um, maybe they approach it or, or they do something that they don't know is wrong that could that could harm the animal. And um, speaking of education, you guys have um, courses available, right? Could you tell us a little bit about those? Absolutely, yes. So um, essentially anyone can get involved with BDMLR as long as you're aged over 18 uh, and you're really enthusiastic and passionate about the marine environment and doing some really hands-on, uh, you know, physical work with, with, with animals that need help. Um, then you can check out our website, bdmlr.org.uk. Uh, it will tell you a lot more about our Marine Mammal Medic training course on there. And it will also tell you uh, where and when the next training courses will be. So we have between 30 and 40 courses around the UK each year. Um, and people can book online for those and sign up for them. Um, and then you will be sent a online lecture, uh, online video lecture link. Uh, so you can learn more about the species identification, their biology, uh, health assessment and first aid, so on and so forth, decision making as well. And then the actual training day itself will be on a beach and we have a life size seal pup, dolphin and whale. And they're full of water, so they're lifelike weights as well. It does attract a lot of attention from the public on the day. Sometimes people think it, it, it's real uh, and come over to come and see what's going on. Uh, but we'll have our group of trainees uh, led by experienced instructors uh, putting into practice those first aid, health assessment and decision making measures that they learned from the online course into practice and uh, learning some of the other physical rescue techniques as well. So how to catch a seal safely with a towel so we can restrain it and not get bitten, most importantly, but then be able to carry out a full physical health assessment on the animal. Uh, with a dolphin, we'll show people how to use a simple tarpaulin to safely lift and carry the animal down to the sea. And for larger whales, which of course we can't pick up and move, it's using a more heavy duty reflotation pontoon system, uh, which uses compressed gas to fill the pontoons. And when the tide comes in, it will lift the whale for us. And if we can uh, reflote it, then we'll take it out into the water and release it. So once people have trained on our course, uh, you then get added to your uh, regional call out database, so say for Cornwall. Uh, when we have a call out in a part of Cornwall, we'll send a message to all of the volunteers in that part. And it is just a case of who is available at that moment in time, just calls in, gets the details from our hotline coordinator, and can then go out to attend the animal and feedback what they find. Cool. You, so you must have some some success stories of students who have followed one of your courses and then helped you in helped animals in a big way. Do you have any of those like success stories or? Oh, uh, so many, I couldn't, uh, it's hard to pick one. Um, but yeah, we, we, I mean, we have about two and a half thousand volunteers around the country, but as I've already mentioned, we, we are experiencing a huge increase in the number of calls that we're also receiving. So keeping up with demand is actually proving quite difficult now. So uh, we're always on the lookout for new volunteers in all areas of the country to help us keep on top of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many success stories. And I think the ones that probably um, stick out in people's minds are their, their, their first call out, of course, that's always going to stick out in your mind, going to your first animal, being able to help it. And um, I think for me personally as well, some of the animals that you see really struggling that you don't know if they're actually going to make it or not. And then in the end, they do that. You know, they, those can be perhaps some of the most rewarding uh, experiences to be involved with as well um, when that animal clearly is facing death if they haven't been helped. And especially, of course, when it's been caused by people. So things like entanglement in marine litter, uh, you know, it's, it feels like a big victory every time we get one of those because there are still 
other animals out there that we uh, haven't heard about that we can't get to because they're in inaccessible locations. But every time you get one, it does feel like you know, a really big victory and you save that animal from weeks, months, if not years of suffering with, with uh, ligatures around their neck, open to infection and, and a lot of pain as well. So uh, yeah, they, they certainly stick with you. But if, if I suppose, uh, for, for me personally, if I go back to uh, my first ever call out, it, it wasn't straightforward. <laughs> um, it was actually a live stranded minke whale that was about five to six meters long, stranded on a reef just offshore. So not even on the beach, uh, but it was low tide. It got stuck on some rocks and you could see it from the beach. It was only sort of a, a 50 meters off, 100 meters at the most off. And we had to wade and paddle out with our equipment in life jackets and wetsuits and everything to even get to it in the first place. So that, that, that's not a situation that we really ever do uh, come across. It's normally an animal you can walk up to straight on the beach, no paddling involved. Um, and after a few hours, uh, we, we did manage to get that animal back out to sea. Uh, it was a real struggle a couple of times when we had thought we'd got it in the pontoons and we're going to get it off it. It sort of struggled and it got free and it re-stranded on the reef again and we had to do it all over again. But on the third time, uh, we managed to get it out successfully and it didn't come back in after that. So, uh, uh, yeah, for, for, for me, that was an extremely memorable um, uh, call out. Um, and there have been many more since, of course, and we've had some really unusual ones, like you've probably heard of the walruses turning up around the UK in the last three years. Uh, you know, they, they've been absolutely spectacular animals to see, but mainly our role has not been managing the animal, it's been managing the people around it just to keep the animal safe from disturbance and so on. And the animal itself has just sort of been allowed to do what it wants to do. But uh, I know from a lot of the people who have been involved in these various horses around the country, it's just been, you know, a really breathtaking and <laughs> memorable experience for them as well. You, you do sometimes get attached to these animals, and I think with these walruses in particular even more so than usual and with because i i feel like there's some people that in those situations let's say i would walk up to the beach and i see this animal how how do these people know to contact british divers is there how, how do you guys um make yourselves known to the to the public in these situations so that they don't do anything harmful yeah, great question. So we have advice on our website, um, which you can freely access, which gives you some basic do's and don'ts if you come across a live stranded dolphin or a seal pup alone on the beach. So that's usually the first port of call that we signpost people to. Uh, we also have, like in our local areas, our teams are really good around the country at doing promotion of the charity itself through talks at community events, schools, um, getting involved with the local Coast Guard, the RNLI, uh, making themselves known to them as well as sometimes they might be the first port of call, for a, especially for a report of a stranded dolphin, for example. Uh, and by working together, then we, you know, become part of that larger team then with other emergency services that we do work alongside in some situations uh, and need their help with um, sort of public safety and management if there's large crowds and, uh, and so on. Um, but uh, also, like you say, like social media um, and, and online uh, activities also give us a much wider audience that we can reach as well. And some of the incidents that we've been involved with over the years have reached, you know, national, if not international media. So again, things like walruses, large whale strandings, uh, you know, and these have been picked up by the media and people get to hear us uh, about us that way as well. So when they've heard about us, they can then come back and look us up, look at our website, our social media pages, find out who we are, and most importantly, get our hotline number if ever they find something can report it. So looking at your website and your social media, we can see that you're publishing a lot of valuable information and different articles and stuff. And would you say like that is what, what reaches the public ultimately, which then creates some sort of awareness that if if they would ever come across something like that on the beach that they just know hey we need to call these guys the hotline and then you know we can do something about it so it's quite important then the all the content that you're that you're publishing yeah absolutely the um 
you know, there's a few different audiences that we kind of like need, need to try and uh, uh, reach out there. You know, the, the, there are the people who live, work at the coast already, who we most readily come into contact with. But then there are audiences that we might otherwise struggle to reach. So people who live and work inland, who never have much contact with the coast. I was one of those people about 25 years ago. Um, so again, we're doing more work, um, particularly where social media is concerned, because it's a really great way to spread things around audiences. It's readily accessible for people. So that's where a lot of our messaging goes about what to do if you find a seal pup and so on. And they're regular messages that we're putting out. And when get, uh, something gets picked up by the media, again, it gives us some more uh, of an opportunity to share with their viewership, their readership, uh, to, to get messages out to them uh, as well. But then, of course, we also want to get messages across to younger generations as well. So that's where having uh, more uh, uh, material focused towards that generation, that target sort of age group, uh, comes in really handy. So that's where cartoons, infographics, those sort of things that look a bit more colourful and creative and eye-catching can be more usefully used uh, to reach those people, as well as directly coming in to uh, schools to give talks and workshops about what we do as well. Uh, because the children are, you know, they're our future. And if we can get messaging to them at a young age, they'll grow up with that knowledge. And that'll be something that they'll know and be able to share uh, as adults as well. So it's really important that we try and get them to understand why climate change is such a serious issue and the little things that they can change at home uh, or, or elsewhere to, to make the world a little bit of a better place in their own way and they can contribute something to that. Everyone can contribute something to that. Um, and that's a really important takeaway message with, with anything to do with climate change is that we don't just leave it to the governments, we don't just leave it to the big businesses to sort their acts out. We've all got to play a little part in it as well um, and, and hopefully everyone working together making their little contributions no matter how small it all does you know come together it will it will have a bigger effect if more people are doing little things rather than one or two people doing big things um, so that's where it's really important to have that that sort of crossover and that overlap so having a lot of people who can support those goals will will make them more successful Sorry, out of out of curiosity, um, you were mentioning these like tips that you would give children on an environmental side. What would you could you share these tips? Like, what's something we could do better to to help the the ocean, to help these animals? So, uh, some of the key things that people can do are to use a little less carbon uh, essentially is, is the ultimate goal so whether that's one car journey less a week uh, using public transport cycling or walking to the shops rather than taking the car yeah. um, to, you know just small things like that that reduce carbon emissions from vehicles is a really good way and also of course things like cycling and walking is good for physical and mental health as well um, using less water at home as well uh, can be a good contributing factor and uh, if, if People are also inclined looking into um, alternative green energy suppliers, renewable energy suppliers that use solar and wind, hydroelectric, for example, rather than fossil fuels. And there are some companies that exclusively use those uh, sources of power as well. So, again, that's something that people can look into and support. And the more support they get, the sooner they'll grow um, and be more successful again. Um, and it also comes down to things like pollution as well. Plastic pollution, again, has been in the news in the last few years because people are really starting to see and understand the devastating effect that's having on wildlife and the environment too. So uh, again, it's things like using less single-use plastics, use alternatives that you can reuse rather than just throw away after the one time you used it, like plastic bottles or plastic cutlery, things like that. Uh, choosing alternative uh, food at the supermarket when you go shopping, things that are packaged in cardboard rather than plastic uh, as well. Um, that's not only reducing the amount of plastic being used, but it sends a message back to manufacturers that people don't want to buy things that are housed in layers and layers of plastic. Um, and it helps them, encourage them to, to change their, their ways as well. Uh, doing a lot more recycling as well as the plastics that you do use and other materials. Again, that's a really good way of reducing waste and plastics and other items that might be entering 
uh, oceans because ultimately at the end of the day uh, around 80 percent of the litter in our oceans or plastic in our oceans started its life on land being blown around down the street eventually ends up in a stream that washes into a river that washes into an estuary that leads into the ocean uh, so people can get involved not just in beach cleans which people are probably much more familiar about hearing of but you can do street cleans and river cleans because cleaning up those places is also helping ultimately to clean up the ocean too so what are some of the the plans or the goals that you guys are working towards in the next five years or something like what's on what's going to happen in the future what are some of the things you want to focus on or improve or yeah can you can you share a bit more of course yes yeah. so um our, our first and foremost challenge is to keep up with the demand of call outs that we're receiving um i mean they can't keep going up forever but it certainly feels like that way in the last few years. So one of our key targets operationally is to continue growing the charity, not just in terms of its volunteers, but also with staffing and resources. Um, evolving our training is always uh, important to us because as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're really regularly learning new things about the animals, new techniques uh, from our own experiences, but also the experiences we share with our colleagues from overseas and other countries and other strandings networks as well. And as we learn these new things and share these new things amongst ourselves, we can adapt our protocols to uh, help rescue animals um, in different ways that might be more efficient, might be more comfortable for the animal, that kind of thing. So operationally, that's what we're looking at in the future. Uh, and they're probably our most immediate things on our to-do list, I suppose. Uh, aside from that though, it will be to continue with increasing the uh, range and depth of our conservation work so getting involved in more uh, local regional uh, national even international projects um, using more of our data to put towards research as well as that's something we've only relatively recently started doing in the last few years more actively um, and we're in a really unique position we are the only organization in the uk that fully covers the whole country with a response network and we're gathering data from across the whole country as well so uh, there are many other uh, organizations we work with who are covering perhaps just england and wales or just scotland or they're just covering the local area to them um, and they have data to contribute as well but we're the only ones who actually have the whole national picture essentially at our fingertips and it's really important that we try and get more of that kind of data put to good use yeah do you have any other questions um well my it's it's related to the data i'm i saw on your website that you guys have the cornwall seal hospital and that this is relatively new do you also gather data from there and, and then you share from from there or is it mostly from the the lines the calls you get so the Cornwall seal hospital is uh that's been a really exciting project for us um in the last couple of years so we've had temporary holding places for seals in the past and smaller seal units uh but this is the first time we've actually had a purpose built uh, hospital, large hospital um, that we're actually operating and we have uh, a vet who manages that unit as well who works for us so th this has been a huge step forward for us as a charity it's the, the, the biggest project that we've actually done ourselves now um, so we're incredibly lucky that in the first place we were able to, to pull it off essentially we've been uh, you know building towards this for a good 10 years or so in the Cornwall areas it's gotten quite a lot busier uh, so to actually have it now, it's it's been a hugely valuable resource, and not only uh, just for the local area, but for other areas as well. As we've hosted volunteers from other parts of the country, including from the west coast of Scotland, from um, East Anglia, and other areas, to come down and get some more hands-on experience from um, from our lead people down here at the Seal Hospital, uh, where I get to learn more about seal handling and assessment um some of the other more involved techniques such as uh, uh using the tube to, uh, to to give rehydration fluids direct to the stomach for example so uh people have found it you know it's a hugely valuable resource in that respect but it's also given us the opportunity as you mentioned to gather more data for ourselves 
uh, start our own research projects uh, as well. So one of the really interesting ones that we've been looking at in the last couple of years is to uh, measure the body length of the patients when they are admitted and their girth as well. And from these body measurements and their weight as well, uh, and their approximate age, we can start getting a gauge of what ages and weights animals are at different stages in their life and how big, how big, how long they are. Um, and we're also backing this up now with an ultrasound that uh, we have up there so we can get a look at their blood depth measurement. Um, so it's giving us a much deeper insight into animal nutrition. Uh, and animal health as well by giving us a lot more valuable information on say an animal that is four weeks old um, it's this long it has this girth and it has this weight and from those things we can then extrapolate from the ultrasound data that we've gathered that that animal with those dimensions should have a blood of layer that is this thick and it will give us as I say a better insight into is that animal in trouble because its blubber layer is too thin or is that okay? Uh, you know, it will really help us in the future with our assessments on the beaches and decision making if we've got a better understanding of the animal's nutritional status versus its age and size. So that's a really exciting one that we've got going on. We've got a long way to go yet because it's still early days, of course. We need a lot more data. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it, it's coming along quite well and we've got some quite interesting results uh, early on so far. Yeah, and and for sure it it must be since your organization is heavily um, focused as well in 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 the environment, it would be a great way to measure how things progress with climate change and how that affects the body composition of these animals that are getting washed up. So this is it's it's a lot of work that that you have ahead, and and then that's exciting. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it, it, it's things like that. We've now got the opportunity to start doing our own projects. We, we haven't really had an opportunity like that before. So uh, I'm sure there'll be much more to come in the future. Uh, we just need to think of them uh, and find the time to do them in. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for this lovely chat then. And so if people want to learn a little bit more about the organization, about British Divers, where can they go to or what can you share? Oh, uh, for sure. Go to our website, www.bdmlr.org.uk. You can find lots more on there. Um, there'll be, you, you know, there's the Marine Mammal Medic training course on there first and foremost, if that's what people are interested in and want to look at getting involved with us. Um, our resources page has lots of scientific works that we've been involved with over the last few years as well. So people who are interested in the research side can have a look at there and see what's available. Um, and of course, we've just got general information about the species we most commonly encounter as well. So you can read up on those. And of course, the do's and don'ts if you find one yourself on the beach that you're concerned about. And we're on social media as well, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. So do check us out on there. We're pretty active on uh, all of them. We've um, uh, just gotten into YouTube in the last couple of years. So we've got a few videos on there and we're gradually building up that library. And you can get a really good feel from there what we're actually doing what things actually look like when we're involved with animals that need rescuing amazing it's great thank yeah. you so much thank you so much for, for this call